To Real Democracy Now. I'm Nevek Thompson and Real Democracy Now is a podcast for people who think we can and should improve how democracy works. This podcast looks at democracy from different angles to help you think about how democracy might be improved. Welcome to Episode 7 in Season 2 of Real Democracy Now, a podcast. Today I'm speaking with Professor Mark Warren. Professor Warren is the Harold and Dory Merrilees Chair in the Study of Democracy in the Department of Political Science at the University of British Columbia. Mark established the Centre for the Study of Democratic Institutions at the University of British Columbia. His current research interests fall within the field of democratic theory. He is especially interested in new forms of citizen participation, new forms of democratic representation, the relationship between civil society and democratic governance, and the corruption of democratic relationships. I'm talking with Mark today about his latest paper entitled A Problem-Based Approach to Democratic Theory. Thanks so much for joining me today, Mark. My understanding is that rather than a model-based approach, you're suggesting a problem-based approach. Can you describe how this approach works and why you think it is more useful than the traditional model-based approach? Yes. So the approach is driven by a couple of problems. First of all, uh, whatever uh, a strong democracy is going to look like, uh, it's going to be fairly complex uh, in today's uh, complex societies, making use of uh, lots of different kinds of uh, institutions and practices. Models-based approaches, uh, models like deliberative democracy, participatory democracy, you know, elite democracy, and so on, they uh, always oversimplify. They uh, center democracy on, uh, you know, a key institution or practice like uh, elections or deliberation. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that we should step back from some of these uh, important uh, and even archetypal uh, democratic institutions and practices and ask instead a different type of question as to how we get more democracy. Uh, we should ask what a political system needs to accomplish if it's going to function democratically. And if we ask this question, I think we can then come up with a fairly short list of basic functions, I guess I would call them. You know, in the way that I, I develop this approach, I, I talk about uh, empowered inclusion, you know, whatever else a democracy does, it has to get people to the table and has to give them some power to to voice their, uh, you know, interests and concerns and some power to enforce their voice. Uh, so that's one kind of function. Uh, a second is uh, collective will formation. So people need to be able to connect their interests, to figure out what their interests are and then connect their interests to, you know, a collective will and to form agendas and, and figure out what, you know, issues are about. And then finally, democracies need to make collective decisions. There has to be a, a there there so that people can then, you know, people can do things for themselves, uh, you know, provide for social security or health care security or, or all of the uh, many kinds of things that, that uh, democratic uh, systems do. So if we uh, think about these very generic functions, then we can ask about how we would get them. And so the other piece of this approach is to think about very generic kinds of democratic practices, uh, things like voting or deliberating or resisting or representing uh, and so on. And if we think about each of these kinds of practices relative to the functions, then we can see that some practices are strong uh, at fulfilling some kinds of functions and uh, weak in others. So, for example, uh, deliberation is uh, what you need for uh, clarifying preferences and forming collective wills and agendas. Uh, but it's actually not a great decision making practice. And in contrast, uh, voting is a, a great decision making mechanism, but it's not very good at uh, forming collective agendas or wills uh, because it's really just a kind of signal. So, Ideally, we would be able to think about democratic systems that are gathering up the strengths of a variety of 
practices like voting or representing or deliberating and minimizing uh, weaknesses. So, you know, we want to think about uh, voting and deliberation as complementing one another rather than trading off uh, against one another. So when we take this approach, then we get a couple of things that more traditional approaches to democratic theory don't supply. First of all, we can avoid identifying democracy with any single institution uh, like elections. And this allows us to imagine uh, new mixes of practices. I'm quite interested in, in uh, trying to expand our uh, democratic imagination, but doing it in a way that's uh, fairly systematic. Uh, we can use this kind of approach to assess emerging political innovations for their contributions to democracy. Uh, and we can provide a fairly strong account of, of democratic systems that encompasses a high degree of complexity because, you know, whatever else political systems are today, they're, they're really complicated. And then finally, uh, because political systems are um, highly path dependent, that is, you know, um, in, in Canada, we start with uh, Westminster democracy. In the U.S. Uh, starts with a separated power system. Uh, we can then think about, can think systematically about where a given system is weak and think about the, you know, the democratic problems that it isn't solving, and then uh, hopefully draw on this kind of arsenal of, of uh, democratic practices to uh, design problem-specific fixes. So that's uh, what I was up to when I was trying to think about a, a new way of, of thinking about democratic theory. And I know um, I came across your work in this area because I saw that you were speaking at a workshop at Westminster University fairly recently about your approach. What sort of response have you got from other people in the area, particularly model-based theorists, to your proposed approach? <laughs> well, uh, I, I think it's a fair amount of uh, excitement. Uh, I think that people have been uh, kind of frustrated with the you know, democracy with adjectives approach, uh, where every theorist uh, attaches an adjective to their model of democracy. You know, I'm trying to think about building democratic theory in a way that has room for uh, a lot of different kinds of contributions. And uh, I think a, a number of people are uh, seeing that space. But, you know, the, the, the article just came out, and uh, so it's kind of early days on the, on the responses. Uh, but so far, uh, a, a lot of positive feedback. And in a way, it, it strikes me that there's some similarity, and you certainly talk, you know, you've actually mentioned thinking systematically. There's some similarity here, I guess, broadly with the deliberative systems model, which aims to sort of look beyond any particular institution or institutional arrangement. Yes, I think that's exactly right. And the deliberative systems idea helped to get me thinking along these lines. Uh, I think that the problem with the deliberative systems approach, and I say this as somebody who uh, kind of signed on to uh, this approach uh, early on, is that it's still sort of single mechanism. Uh, it's focused on uh, where deliberation occurs within a political system and how those points of deliberation add up, which is a great problem. But I think that we want to take one step back and ask uh, how a deliberative system contributes to a democratic system. That is, bring the, the, the questions back to uh, questions of democracy. That's so interesting, uh, particularly for me with my PhD research. One of the things that I've been struggling with is that broader idea of where where do different things fit in in a democracy i've been trying to tease out in my own mind you know is there a difference between democratic participation and other types of participation that you might say are non are not really contributing to a democracy or does any sort of participation by citizens between elections contribute to a democracy uh well i think that's right it's it, it's hard to think systematically because uh, in a system, you know, every practice is interacting with every other practice and uh, everything's quite contingent. You know, however we build theory, we need to figure out how to uh, simplify our thinking about systems and to think about the 
uh, sort of relative strengths of different uh, ways, means and kinds of, of participation. You refer to these problems or functions, I guess, as being relevant to answering the question of whether a political system counts as a democracy. How well do you think our current systems of representative democracy, and I'm happy for you just to pick Canada if, if that makes it easy, are functioning from the perspective of your approach? Uh, well, I think that the, you know, the, the strength of representative democracies is that they uh, build uh, on voting, and uh, voting has some important and irreplaceable democratic system strengths. Uh, you know, the vote is, uh, I think as um, Bob Gooden puts it, it's the uh, shotgun behind the door that citizens can use when they uh, really need to make a point. But this said, in all of the developed democracies, elections are doing less work, I think, than they did uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years ago uh, in terms of generating democratic legitimacy. Uh, a lot of these problems are kind of well-tracked and well-studied, you know, declining trust in, in political institutions and in government, for example. So in terms of representative democracy, I think that we do need to continue to focus on making elections better. And this, again, will be system contingent. Uh, for example, we have an ongoing conversation in Canada about uh, whether we should move to proportional representation uh, types of systems. <clears throat> but we also need to think about ways and means for forming collective wills beyond elections and then building conduits for these uh, new and different kinds of practices uh, into our political systems. You know, there isn't going to be any single fix, uh, probably lots of small fixes, uh, issue by issue, case by case. Uh, one of the things that I've been quite interested in uh, recently is the amount of experimentalism uh, in the developed democracies, but also in other countries as well. Uh, new kinds of democratic innovations like uh, citizens' juries and citizenship assemblies and deliberative polls and and. Socrates cafes, and uh, there are, you know, probably 100 to 150 named and branded uh, innovations. We uh, need to think about where these innovations might fit and where they might do the most good, uh, where they might um, supplement elections and underwrite, uh, you know, increasing democratic legitimacy. Uh, you know, where they might. Uh, provide for new conduits of, of inclusion uh, or where they might uh, provide uh, epistemic benefits that is, uh, you know, help decision makers just make better decisions uh, and so on. So, again, this is part of the reason for thinking about a problem-based approach to democratic systems. When we think in these terms, we can think about uh, kind of uh, niche benefits that uh, different kinds of uh, innovations might provide. So to take a step back, you know, representative democracy, electoral democracy is great and we can't do without it, but we need to think about um, uh, supplementing and layering uh, new types of innovations onto or underneath or beside uh, representative democracies to backfill uh, this kind of decreasing uh, amount of democratic legitimacy that we're getting off of elections. Now, I, I could give one example of this. In uh, the Western uh, states in the U.S., uh, there is a, a long history of ballot initiatives where citizens, where citizens put an issue on the ballot through uh, petition. The uh, weakness of this, so the strength of this device is that it provides a certain uh, directness and people you know, get some power, they get some extra power through uh, these direct democracy types of processes. But they're not great processes from the standpoint of uh, deliberativeness or informed input or uh, accountability. Uh, you know, people will do things through a ballot initiative and uh, there's no accountability to themselves for what they did. The state of Oregon is... Um, you know, figured out uh, that 
ballot initiatives are a problem, uh, but they're not going away. They're very popular. And so they've started to supplement ballot initiatives with uh, a citizen's jury process uh, to add in an element of uh, deliberativeness. The, uh, the process, as you probably know, uh, involves a, a more or less random selection of 20 to 24 uh, citizens. They spend five days uh, hearing from experts and advocates and deliberating and coming up with uh, yes and no positions and the rationales for these positions. They put their results into the Oregon voters pamphlet and then voters, voters in Oregon uh, pay fairly close attention to the voters pamphlet. And research is showing that as a result of this citizen's jury, people uh, know a little bit more than they would otherwise know when they go into the ballot booth to vote. Uh, and where the panels come up with a consensus, people are beginning to use the panels as a trusted information proxy. That is, they might not learn everything they need to learn about a ballot initiative, but they trust that the citizens' jury has done their homework and they don't have any access to grind. And so that kind of improves the, uh, the quality of their vote. So this is a very specific example, but it's an example of a path-dependent practice, the ballot initiative, uh, that is supplemented with a new form of representation, that is uh, a citizens' jury that is um, – you know, it looks very much like the, uh, you know, in this case, the Oregon public. And within this, there's a new form of deliberativeness that uh, sometimes affects uh, mass public votes uh, through uh, inducing people to learn a little bit more, sometimes uh, increases the quality of their votes uh, simply through a, a trusted information proxy mechanism. So we need a lot more of this kind of thing, in my view. I mean, I think one of the interesting things is uh, we can only speculate what would have happened in the UK if there'd been a citizen's jury providing advice to people around the Brexit referendum. Uh, that would have been quite interesting. You've said that the citizens used um, the advice from the citizen's jury process and they see it as a, a trusted information proxy. Is there actual research telling us anything about what the citizens, the citizens' views on these um, advisory documents, or is it more anecdotal? So with the BC Citizens Assembly, we did a uh, public survey uh, in the period after the assembly disbanded and before the uh, uh, referendum. And we threw in a number of trust questions, uh, not knowing what we would find. What we found was that uh, there were kind of two classes of voters. Uh, one class of voters uh, was mostly interested in whether the people in the assembly were are people like us. And from that, if they could say yes, from that they uh, inferred uh, that the citizens' assembly, you know, had the public interest in view. And that was enough to trust what the assembly was recommending. Uh, another group of voters um, asked those questions, but they also asked competence questions. That is, did the citizens' assembly uh, kind of do their homework and know what they're talking about? Uh, and if they could get to yes on that, then, then that uh, predicted a, a yes vote on the referendum. That is, they, it's kind of a, 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 a double trust uh, threshold. And so, you know, we were a little bit surprised by these findings, uh, but somewhat encouraged because, as you probably know, trust in political institutions is flatlining and declining in most systems. And so to be able to build an institution that generates trust like this is really an interesting kind of accomplishment. The uh, surveys were showing that the amount of trust that citizens of BC were placed in the, in the Citizens' Assembly, had everyone known about it, uh, the level of trust would be like the trust shown in school teachers or professors or medical doctors or that kind of thing. So very high uh, when compared to trust in political institutions. Some of these same kinds of questions have been asked by uh, John Gastel and his colleagues uh, John Gastel is in communications at uh, Penn State, 
And uh, he's been following the Oregon Citizen, Citizens Initiative Review and uh, some other states that have started to develop, that have adopted this process and is uh, finding much the same kind of thing where panels uh, agree on an issue, then people are uh, likely to trust them. Where panels disagree, where you have split panels, of course, you don't have the conditions for trust, uh, but that does um, induce people to pay uh, closer to attention to what the panel is, is saying. Where do considerations such as economic and social equality fit within your problem-based approach? In the language that I use, um, of the three things that I think that political systems need to um, show or to have or to demonstrate in order to count as democratic, the kind of first of these three things is uh, empowered inclusion. Uh, And so, and the way that I think about this uh, is much the same way that other democratic theorists think about it is that if, you know, your interests are affected by decisions and especially government decisions, then you should have a say of some sort. And in terms of political systems, we should look at the uh, ways and means in which people are uh, empowered to have a say. And so you know, the most, most basic kind of say is, of course, having a vote. But there are also, uh, you know, ways of asking people or including people in ways that are even more robust than, than voting. So one of the uh, attractions, for example, of uh, a citizens assembly kind of mechanism would be that, it, that it's a near random draw of a population and will tend to include people who uh, might not even show up at the polls, but would certainly be underrepresented, say, in a a legislature or some kind of elected body. But more generally, I think, uh, you know, we want to look at lots of different pathways for uh, inclusion, uh, inclusion of people whose uh, interests are affected by collectivities. Trust, or I suppose more accurately, lack of trust in democracy, is often raised as a key challenge at the moment. How do you see this issue playing out and what can be done to address it? Yeah, great question. Uh, Trust, uh, as you know, in political institutions specifically and government more generally, has been uh, flatlining uh, or declining in uh, all of the developed democracies uh, over the last couple of decades. The concern is that if people don't trust their uh, collective uh, capacities, right, their um, uh, collective agents, uh, their governments, then it's very hard for governments to, uh, to represent people and to uh, provide for people all of the things that democratic governments should be providing. You know, securities, protections, rights, um, you know, uh, welfare, education, health, uh, and so on. Uh, And so the trust question is very closely linked to that uh, collective capacity question. If we take a step back, yes, so democracy was born out of distrust of political elites. And mostly democracy is about um, building devices and institutions that uh, align the interests of the people with the interests of elites. And democracies tend to work if people are uh, uh, somewhat distrustful of that alignment, so that they are constantly checking to uh, see whether elites are actually serving them uh, or not. And then using, uh, you know, protest, votes, resistance, and so on and so forth to uh, express their distrust to uh, remove untrustworthy elites and to uh, insert elites that are more trustworthy. But if a, democ- if a democratic system is working well, uh, it should be able to settle the distrust. That is, if the mechanisms of interest alignment are working, then one of the results of that uh, should be uh, more and more trustworthy uh, outcomes, more and more trustworthy agencies and ministries and other um, uh, collective agents of the people. So I think this formula 
probably is still relevant. If, if we want more trust in government, uh, which we need if we're going to do things for ourselves, then we need more democracy. And we need more democracy because the uh, basics of trust are still mostly about interest alignment. That is, uh, uh, mechanisms that, um, that uh, induce elites to align their interests and careers with the uh, interests and well-being uh, of the people. So if you want trust, you work on democracy, I guess is what I would say. From your perspective, what part does lack of trust play in the concept of the democratic deficit? I think that lack of trust reflects a democratic deficit. Uh, if you are not able to use the democratic tools that you have or believe that you can't use those tools to uh, enforce uh, an interest alignment between uh, you know, me and my government or us and our government, then you will not think that democracy or the tools of democracy that you have uh, is very effective and you won't trust the outcomes of those tools. So I think that the democratic deficit and the trust deficit are probably two sides of the same coin, uh, more or less. Mm, that's interesting. Thanks. Something that I've asked other people um, and raised is this issue of to what extent the design of representative democracy has the deficit built into it structurally, I guess. And I think that feeds back to your problem-based approach, being that we can't actually rely on electoral democracy to deliver everything we want from democracy. Yes, I think that's right. Elections are put into place and remove governments. But in uh, functioning democratic political systems, you have a, a lot more that needs to go on, a lot more that needs to get done. Uh, you need uh, agencies and ministries that are um, unlike the political branches, branches of government. Uh, they need to be inclusive and impartial. Uh, they need to be uh, answering to the public good rather than uh, attending to a party platform. And this is not new. This has uh, always been the case. And it's you know, part of the reason that uh, every functioning democratic system separates the political branches of government, uh, legislatures and uh, the political parts of presidencies and so on, from things like uh, ministries and executive agencies and judicial systems and other organs of government that were they to become uh, politicized by elections, uh, would no longer be able to uh, serve the public good, uh, act impartially. And uh, do the uh, you know the other kinds of things, the other uh, sort of fully inclusive kinds of things that you know we expect of, of democratic governments. Thanks for joining me today. In next week's episode, I will be talking to Professor Arkon Fung about pragmatic democracy and how we might save democracy from ourselves. I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for listening to Real Democracy Now. You can find more about today's topic in the show notes at www.realdemocracynow.com.au. If you enjoyed this program, please subscribe to this podcast, write a review, share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation on the webpage or on Facebook or Twitter. I'd love to know what you think is the essence of a real democracy.